Hello, and welcome to episode 38 of the Sci-Fi Podcast. From Bloomington, Indiana, I'm Nick Zoutra. On today's podcast, I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Allison Wiley, professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of British Columbia and future president of the Philosophy of Science Association. As a philosopher of the social and historical sciences, Allison is committed to philosophical analysis that is grounded in an understanding of research practice in the field she studies, informed by the social contextual histories of these sciences and normative and orientation. She is particularly interested in epistemic issues raised by archaeological practice and by feminist research in the social sciences and in issues of accountability to those affected by social and historical research. These three areas overlap with and inform one another, reinforcing her appreciation of the need for philosophical analysis of research practice that transgresses traditional boundaries between epistemology and value theory and between philosophical, historical, and social cultural science studies. And thus, without further ado, let's bring in Allison. Dr. Allison Wiley, uh, welcome to the Sci Fi Podcast. How are you uh, this morning? Just fine. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you so much for coming on and for your enthusiasm. Um, uh, and yeah, thank you for taking the time to do uh, a couple more, another interview. Uh, I know you've been, you've had, you've had some good chats with some other folks. Uh, is that the case? Yeah, there, well, a couple. Um, there, there are some published interviews, and then uh, the Dewey lecture is mm. uh, always somewhat autobiographical. And I did one of those for the Pacific APA last spring. Yeah. Okay. So, lots of me out there. <laughs> great, great, great. Well, hopefully this will be, you know, um, we'll cover, I imagine, maybe some ground from those, but uh, maybe something new will emerge. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Great. And where, uh, where are we, uh, where am I speaking to you from, or where, where are you uh, calling yeah. us from? I'm I'm uh, in Vancouver in my office oh, okay. at UBC. I moved up here to UBC just last fall. Um, I've been nominated for a Canada Research Chair. Wow! Congratulations. Which was the <clears throat> excuse me was the. Oh, we might have lost you. Hold on one second. Yeah, you've frozen too. Oh, oh no! <laughs> okay, okay, we'll, we'll keep going. <laughs> You were, yeah. you, you were saying about the uh, Canada Research Chair? Yeah, just I've been nominated for that all here in the next month or so. Um, but I'm you know, now a faculty member in philosophy at UBC, which is great. It's a wonderful department, great colleagues. I miss my UW colleagues, yeah. but they're not that far away. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I guess you guys are maybe a couple hours away or something like about that. About three-hour drive, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, that's good. And well, have an access card. We'll travel. It's easy to get. <laughs> so. Great, great. Well, well, I'm interested to hear, uh, you know, how how the trends and how has it been? I guess going it's been great. Them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's always you know, there's a learning curve, learning a new university. Like, where are the bathrooms? <laughs> Who right, do you right. call <laughs> for? Whatever. But everybody's been tremendous. It's been really supportive, and great. I'm I'm really glad to be here. And one of the great things, I mean, this might be something you'd ask about later, but yeah. Um, UBC has these research cluster, the, the Vice President Research Innovation, BPRI's office, had a, has a pot of money, and they're in the second of a three-year trial period. They make available on a competitive basis for what they call research clusters. And a lot of them, of course, are in medicine and STEM fields. But um, when I got here, I was invited to join a cluster run by a colleague in anthropology, Andrew Martindale. He's an archaeologist who's worked in the, in the Northwest area for a long time. It's called Indigenous Science. Um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, the motivation for it is, in part, the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission, 
report, which came out in 2015, that, that had to do with the hideous history of residential schools, which mm. the last one of those closed in 1998, when actually when I moved to the States, mm. so 20 years ago, uh, very recent history. But this project is about bringing together researchers. Uh, the anchor are a group of archaeologists and then lab-based scientists they work with mm. to go out to First Nations communities and say, Here's the range of kind of tools and expertise we have. What might indigenous-led projects look like that you'd like to see done? And the groups that we're contacting, the, the communities we're in touch with are ones where individuals have working relationships, but the idea is to see what a, a kind of consortium could offer. Um, and that, that project is underway, got funded in the fall. Fantastic. But interestingly, Fantastic. they wanted, um, I got invited to join it because um, Andrew and, and others involved, his uh, initial co main co-PI is a, um, a geochemist, Dominique uh, Weiss here, who runs a huge mass spectrometry lab and, you know, samples volcanoes all over the world, <laughs> does various <laughs> kinds of things. Anyway, um, they wanted to have a, a, a kind of working group that they're we're calling like the reflection group, but they invited me to be in it. I've invited Dan Steele, a philosopher of science here in the Applied Ethics Institute and a colleague in philosophy, Sylvia Barrowman. There's also a couple of Native American scholars uh, in various contexts, anthropology and um, uh, what is it? First Nations and Endangered Languages program uh, and some linguists who work with that program that, our mandate is to um, kind of observe and uh, monitor and reflect on the language of reflection, how the process is going, what, what assumptions are being disrupted, where the blockages are, what makes for good practice. Uh, I have an interest in analyzing memorandum of agreement and understanding and how those get formulated and when they're used. Uh, among other things. So, yeah. so that's a project that just was happening when I got here. And uh, it's been so exciting to be involved in it. It's a collaborative project. Um, so rather than write about collaborative practice, thinking about what difference collaboration makes, which I've published a few things recently in the last five or so years about that, I'm I'm now trying to figure out how to actually be a collaborator in one of these projects. <laughs> so uh, anyway, yes, yeah, so, I exciting. mean, how? Yeah, no, yeah. Perhaps I would love to hear more about this. I mean, how is? Yeah. Right. You have to ask history, I know, but this is you. So that's what. Then so you're that, actually getting to collaborate. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, so that was. I knew there was a really great group of archaeologists here who most, all of whom have worked in collaboration in, in the region. Yeah. I have a number of terrific colleagues at UW as well, but this is a bigger group and they're all connected in with this fabulous Museum of Anthropology that's famous for its collaborative work yeah. with First Nations artists and, uh, you know, weavers, sculptors. Um, and, you know, anyway, they've, they've been doing this for a long time and there's a kind of critical mass and it just crystallized as this uh, fabulous and UBC funded uh, research cluster. So anyway, I'm glad to be here. Fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled for That's you. I'm excited. <laughs> it's, it's excited to, to jump right into some a new adventure and a new research yeah. project right even, you know, at a new school. So. Uh, yeah, I thought I might get into something like this over the next five or seven years, and I built it into my CRC nomination proposal that, you know, in over the period of the CRC, which is a seven-year run, this is what I'd like to do, but I didn't think it would happen for sure. several years. So anyway, it's very cool. Cool. Well, well I'm excited to, to chat about that. Let's um, let's take a step back and and uh, let's start back from the beginning in terms of your origin story. Uh, so Allison, tell us, where did you grow up? Well, my father was Canadian military, um, so we moved around every year and a half. Um, I seem to be getting my Canadian accent back, like with a question at the end of every sentence. <laughs> 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 it was Canadian military. <laughs> anyway, we, yeah, yeah so I was just in north of Quebec City. My mother was trained as a statistician. She actually went to UBC as an undergrad and did grad work at Columbia in statistics, worked with Abraham Wall there, did, uh, and then worked for the Stats Canada. Uh, so when we were in Ottawa, she worked for Stats Canada or for Corporate Consumer Affairs. And when we weren't, she did project work for Corporate Consumer Affairs. But anyway, we moved around a lot. So 
uh, Canada, but um, not a particular place in Canada, mostly Eastern Canada. I was born in England because my father had been posted to a military college of science outside Oxford. And he was there, I think, for almost 10 years, initially on a course and then teaching. He was a, um, an engineer, um, mm-hmm. geoengineering and um, electrical engineering. Oh, wow. So, that, so he was interested in long wave transmission uh, at a time when there weren't satellites. So you'd be bouncing these, you know, radio, well, these signals off of the ionosphere. And they were figuring out uh, the problem, the constraint was how you would um, – encode enough information to make it worthwhile and then be able to decode it. But anyway, that's the kind of stuff he worked on post-war. And uh, so I, I was, as it, as it happened, I was a Canadian born abroad in England. So I have wow. a British passport and a Canadian passport. Oh, and, I didn't, I didn't realize. Okay. So you understand, yeah. and, but so born in England and then mostly um, you said it was in Quebec. Was that, or Montreal? Oh, well, northern, um, the military bases we were on, one is yeah. north of Quebec City, Camp El Cartier. Yeah. Um, and we were there periodically in Ottawa and also in Kingston. So in eastern Canada, Ottawa and, and uh, northern Quebec. I went to college at Mount Allison University in New Brunswick. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Th- lots of – there's not a particular place that yeah, yeah. You know, is absolutely home, but certainly that those, those are places where I grew up, yeah. And so, uh, if you can, if, you know, reflecting on that time and, you know, coming to a place, place, you know, what kinds of things were, were you interested as a kid? What did you like to do? Uh, let me think. Well, mostly I read a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you move around as a kid, you know, you yeah. get, like, you know, just kind of lived inside of lots, lots of reading. But one thing that my, and this I've said in other interviews, so I'll just say it very briefly, but my, my parents, especially my father, was an avid avocational archaeologist. Hmm. And uh, um, they would, and a, and a colleague of his in the Canadian military, Jim Pendergast, who became a quite famous uh, archaeologist, um, he, they would get their holidays, their two-week, you know, military holiday at the same time, and they would get. They worked with the National Museum in Ottawa, and the, the museum would say, "Well, we'd like thus and such a site to be surveyed or test excavated." And so these families would, you know, maybe go out for two weeks, take a couple of extra weeks of leave on the, in the case of the parents, and we'd all, you know, be camped out or living in a farmhouse or something and working on these sites. So from the time I was about 10, I guess it was, I was on sites in the summers along the St. Lawrence River. So these were Algonquin and Huron, Iroquoian sites and Huron sites. Yeah. Um, and mostly, I think, uh, immediate pre-contact and contact period sites. Uh, so, so yeah, I did, but the thing is that that was a formative experience, but yeah, what I didn't was that? love it at the time. I thought it was, <laughs> What I do you think? It, what was that experience like for you? Yeah. I thought it was pretty hideous as a kid. Everybody <laughs> I knew got to go to camp and learn how to canoe, and I had to dig holes in the ground, <laughs> like hold stadia rods for these military engineers when they surveyed. Um, they would put us on, uh, They often to test the limits, the exterior uh, boundaries of sites, they'd put us on yeah. uh, a, a pit. The kids would get to dig a, an excavation pit where they thought it, w- it was sterile, where they didn't expect to find any cultural material. And almost invariably, we found cultural material, and we'd get booted off that pit. And then, you know, wow. So in revenge, we would go through the back dirt from the grown-ups' excavations and see what we could find that they missed. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, but that was what it meant was that I had by the yeah. time I was looking for a summer job as an undergraduate, I had several years of uh, field experience, and Jim Pendergast by that time had retired and was um, he retired he took an early retirement and he uh, worked for the National Museum as an uh, I think associate director. So when I was applying for summer jobs. Uh, I applied to Air Canada to be a temporary stewardess. Apparently, I was too tall. <laughs> it, they have height restrictions. Uh, I, did, did, I didn't I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> but I also applied for a Parks, uh, Parks Canada was advertising field assistant or field trainee positions. And Jim Pendergast, you know, wrote me a letter as a sort of family friend. And, um, you know, as a I just finished my first year of college. And so I worked for Parks Canada. I got a job and, huh. and worked for Parks Canada for, I guess it was like six seasons altogether through my undergrad and first couple of years of grad school um, on a site in Saskatchewan, southwest Saskatchewan, uh, Fort, Fort Walsh. 
And so there I really, you know, I, I had some field skills, but that's really where I learned to do archaeology and, and really came to have a passion for it. Yes. Yeah. So while you were working in, in parks and in, so you were, you were do, so while as a parks, were you, did you serve as an archaeologist or were you doing assisting in some ways? Like what, what, what kinds of things did you actually do? Ah, well, um, it was field, field work. And I, oh, I don't yeah. remember the titles, but initially we were a very small crew. So the director, this guy, Jim Cezenti, had been hired. process. Um, and I think all of us did, we had some local, um, like the sons and daughters of local ranchers who uh, were hired as, as field crew, but we all did a lot of excavation. I did a lot of, I did a lot of, ex one summer I spent excavating privies, toilets of different kinds, which are a fabulous archaeological resource, I have to say. They were 100 years old at the time, but okay. um, because people tend not to mess with the stratigraphy. <laughs> and then, and the, so it's very t tightly stratified and um, whatever gets thrown down there stays. And they put, often put like a lime, they would dump lime in on top. So uh, or seal it in various ways. So you would, you could get like a year on year, like these markers for the seven or eight years that they were being used. Um, so yeah, I did a lot of excavation. Um, I also really, um, I, I, I was pretty good. I think at the time uh, doing, uh, stratigraphic profiles and plan views. So I did a lot of mapping uh, and like, you know, in field recording kinds of stuff. Um, and then and the last summer I was there, I was kind of frustrated. And I know the supervisor, this guy, Jim Cezenti, was frustrated by the fact that Parks Canada really just wanted us to look at the fort, which had been rebuilt uh, like a, by the RCMP. Uh, as a horse training and breeding station. And so it was based, you know, it was their vision of what this 19th century fort looked like that they rebuilt. And Parks Canada what has now and was then opening it as a, as a, for a visitor center and a place you could go to see this historic fort. Um, so they really mostly just wanted us to document where the original buildings had actually stood and uh, recover artifacts that they could use in their displays and things of that nature. Uh, we kept trying to expand our remit. So we surveyed, we did a surface survey and, and testing of features on a civilian town site next to the fort. Um, and we're told, as I remember, and I was pretty far down the food chain, so I, I don't know if this was accurate, but, you know, we're pretty sternly told that it was not our business to be documenting any civilian anything. We were supposed to be <laughs> just looking at the fort. And but the other thing was that there was massive Native American First Nations presence in the region. Yeah. Um, Sitting Bull uh, and I think 5,000 Sioux moved north uh, before their confrontation with Custer and requested asylum from the queen, oh. Queen Victoria, and were, the negotiation ultimately had them go back and the rest is history. Um, Little Bighorn happened after that. There were also, there was at least one other large group of, of Plains Native Americans who came up. Uh, but then all the Canadian, all the ones in what became Canadian territory were, you know, being displaced. And uh, this was the main, one of the main places where treaties for better or worse, were being negotiated. Um, the buffalo herds, the, the reason the fort was there was because the, there had been um, a lot of whiskey trading in it. It was one of the main uh, transshipment trading places for lots of independent traders who were taking buffalo hides out. They would take them down in this uh, Mississippi uh, to St. Louis, and then they'd be um, tanned and, you know, used I think a lot were used for um, leather like um, industrial belts leather belts for machinery okay uh, all hides were used for but anyway so in the period that the fort was there from like the 18 what was it 68 or so into the mid 1870s the buffalo herds were basically hunted out the northwest mounted police had been sent in to control the whiskey trade uh, but ultimately, the, what they, a lot of what they did was settle treaties, uh, or that it was a context where treaties were negotiated. 
Um, so there was a big Native American presence in the Cypress Hills around the fort. In the last year I worked at the site, I'd uh, written a proposal to do a walkover survey of the park property to document, especially to document First Nations presence. And whatever was happening at Parks Canada, they approved that. So I spent my last summer doing a walk, like we were, I guess I had about four other people. We were walking in transects across the, the park property in quadrants and uh, recording everything we saw on the surface. And there was a lot of material. There were lots of uh, obvious encampments, tr uh, teepee rings and cairns. And uh, and then that, that would be related to Native American presence. And then lots of clusters of pits of various kinds, uh, like cellar pits and cash pits and so on, that would probably have been related to Métis traders in the region. And at least one site that we thought uh, much by its location and its orientation and its structure would have been pre-contact uh, evidence of uh, Native American presence in the hills before. So that's the kind of work I did. Okay. Yeah. And so it looks like at you know at some point you're doing archaeology, but you started to become interested in the philosophical issues that were that arose or that were going on at the time, um, or 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 were they? I mean, was this something that you know you kind of came to sort of understand and then study or you know how, how did how did you how did you get into the philosophical issues as they related to yeah. archaeological practice well there wasn't any archaeology being taught at mount a the college the little undergraduate college i went to in new brunswick mount allison university in sackville new brunswick um and i was drawn to philosophy so from the time i got to college i was taking philosophy i mean i just it seemed like every class I was in, like history, I was interested in history of ideas or yeah. literature. I was interested essentially in kind of conceptual analysis. So I ended up, you know, gravitating to philosophy and the philosophy. And so that was my first, you know, the first year I was there. Uh, what would that have been? 72, 73. And then that, that summer, 73, is when I first worked at Fort Walsh. And the instructor of my introductory course was Paul Bogard, who uh, had just, was just then, maybe just finished his degree, had just got his, his um, got a job at Mount A. He's a philosopher of chemistry. And so I, in the second year, I took his year long back in the day, history and philosophy of science class. And he encouraged us to think about the philosophical literature we re were reading in terms of a concrete example of philosophical issues in a particular science. So for me, that was archaeology. But I was already aware that there were, that archaeologists were debating philosophical issues and they were drawing on philosophical philosophy of science literature. Mm. And that was partly because this supervisor, uh, Jim Cezenti from the University of Arizona, he assigned us a reading list before we went into the field, and it wasn't just Northwest Mounted Police history or archaeology of the re region. It was a set of philosophy articles or archaeology articles about explanation in archaeology, confirmation. And it was some of the counterpart philosophy. So that everyone uh, writing at the time, these new archaeologists were citing largely Carl Hempel. Yeah. And yeah. We, I was also assigned, you know, Hempel on explanation, Hempel on, uh, you know, hypothetical deductive uh, hmm. models of confirmation. So so the connection with philosophy was there from the beginning. I mean, not from when I was in the field, you know, on family summer breaks, but uh, but certainly from the time I started uh, working semi-professionally <laughs> as a field assistant in Fort Walsh. And what I learned was that at the time, archaeologists were having this great writhing debate about what kind of science they are, whether they're a science, what kind of science, what it means to do archaeology scientifically. And as it was the luck of then having this wonderful course with Paul Bogart, where we were reading all those same authors, you know, with Ad Kuhn and Hansen, uh, Hempel, uh, some Lakatos, the whole, you know, and many of them, or some of them anyway, ones that archaeologists were citing. So I was aware of this literature that was emerging at the intersection where philosophers were engaging philosophy of science and and drawing in some philosophers of science. So Marilee Salmon and Wes Salmon, when they were at the University of Arizona, some of the people who trained my field supervisor got in touch with them and said, we want to know from you yeah. how to think about this, these philosophical issues that are being debated in archaeology. And, you know, Marilee and Wes had, you know, long standing connection with those archaeologists. Marilee published uh, the first monograph um, 
on philosophy of science and archaeology. So anyway, that it, the answer, the short answer is really from the beginning. The connections were already yeah. being made, uh, and I had the luck of being in the field working with an archaeologist who was all over that literature and very interested in those issues, and I had great philosophy of science as an undergrad. Wow. Wow. So how do you think your being in the field really either impacted your then interest in the philosophy? Well, one thing it did was what I've worked on since uh, most intensively. My dissertation was on positivism and the new archaeology, so it was broader than this. But the focal issues that I've been interested in continuously are models of evidential reasoning. And the archaeology, so very, uh, when I finished my dissertation, I pointed to what I saw as, or in the dissertation, I pointed to a tension between these uh, hard edge positivist philosophy of science ideals and what archaeologists were actually doing in practice. So the new archaeologists, the, uh, the sort of programmatic claim not wrapped up in philosophy speak was that archaeologists should be doing more than just collecting and describing the contents of the archaeological record. Um, they needed to be aiming at, they needed to be, have goals of explanation and they should be law governed explanations. And, they, yeah. and to do that, they, they shouldn't just be like gathering data and then speculatively, you know, telling just so stories. They should be testing those hypo as hypotheses, problem oriented uh, hypothesis testing. It turns out this kind of contrast actually had been articulated um, in the early 20th century, like 18 or 1908, 1917, 19, in, in that period, there was already a call in papers with titles like the real new archaeology, amazingly enough, we're saying, look, we, we're beyond, we have to move beyond antiquarian practice, we need to do problem oriented uh, research that really will con contribute an understanding of the human past of broader significance than just curious things. So so that I was interested in that line of debate. But when the new archaeology so but I pointed to attention that actually the goal of going beyond the observables and wanting to understand underlying cultural processes, antecedent events and contexts, uh, um, and especially uh, to understand them in explanatory terms, uh, was not well captured by the positivism that the new archaeologists were invoking, um, at least the, mod the particular models they were invoking. It was better captured, I thought, by the kind of scientific realism that, you know, I was, my super th thesis supervisor was Ram Haray, um, that was being articulated at the time by Dick Boyd and Ram Haray and uh, JJC Smart and people like that. Um, that the goal of science isn't to save the phenomena, but rather to under understand the underlying, often but not necessarily unobservable, processes. So, the dis my dissertation is that there's a sort of tension between what archaeologists want programmatically and what they do in practice, which is really model building, not you know law like hypothesis testing, and the philosophical uh, sort of um, motivational uses of philosophy that they were invoking. Um, what I've done since. Uh, as, as soon as my dissertation was done, that tension really broke out in a major debate within archaeology in which critics of the positivism were post, post processualists they were called, uh, you know, drew a lot on continental sources, actually, but also on Kuhn and uh, philosophers of science who were arguing the case for recognizing the theory lateness of data as evidence and you know, anyway, that the test, anyway, yeah, that, that that literature got invoked, but it tended to push those who were critical of the positivist new archaeology to a position of very strong social constructionism, mm. a very strong relativism. So uh, starting in the, I this mean, I finished. The 1980s? Yeah, 81 is when I finished. My degree date is 82. I think the degree was conferred in January 82. Uh, but by that time, this conflict within archaeology was clear. So a lot of what I was interested in and have been interested in is to show how you can um, develop models of evidential reasoning that indicate why you don't fall off into relativism, you know, craziness yeah. when you recognize that the that archaeological data and the evidence, evidential claims based on data are not um, foundational, right? So you can have you can have all the account of the constructedness and the interpretedness and the theory ladenness and so on, and that doesn't automatically entail 
uh, crazy relativism. So most recently, I've been working with uh, an archaeologist at Reading University in the UK, Bob Chapman. We've done a, a, a collection of essays, material evidence, mostly archaeologists contributing on what they see as evidential best practices. And then a little book that we wrote together, Evidential Reasoning in Archaeology, where uh, it sort of draws in earlier work of mine, but then re reframes it in terms of a series of case studies. Um, and I was using Toolman schemas to represent the very simply evidential reasoning as the claims that arise from practical arguments anchored in various kinds of data or observational claims, but the action is in the mediating warrants. And the mediating warrants are by no means just made up or uh, arbitrary or conventions. They, they are themselves substantive uh, empirical claims very often. So like John Norton on, on induction, yeah. or I just happened to read um, Jim Woodward's uh, revisiting of the Woodward Bogan on, on, on data yeah. and evidence, whatever. There's a whole section in that paper just made my heart sing. I mean, I'd, I had, I'd read it a long time ago. I, I was rereading it and there's a whole section on how central they see or Woodward sees the role of these mediating, this mediating background knowledge, and that's been the core of my account of of evidential reasoning. Wow. Okay. So yeah, that was influenced by being. You, the question was how was my how's my work been inflected by the field work? When you're in the field, you know, reading the new archaeology and all the big picture, you know, here's what we want to be and what it means to be scientific, and then you're down there dealing with these. Uh, very complex archaeological deposits and, and, and the learning to do archaeology in a professional context for me was a matter of learning how to see, learning how, yeah. how complex but also how constrained, empirically constrained in various ways uh, evidential claims are, learning that you so often put a hole in the ground and find stuff that just should not be there given everything you know. So, so anything but the kind of crazy real, real, relativism, you can make it up any way you want, but not, not a foundationalism. So that's the space I've been working in. Great. And, and for those who haven't studied you know, uh, philosophy of science as much in terms of relation to um, archaeology, especially, or just even the various sciences, how are the, the kinds of problems that the evidence in archaeology poses, given that the evidence deals with this evidence of the past? You know, how much more troubling is that for the science other than, let's say, you know, another science, biology or psychology or something like yeah. that? Yeah. Well, and typically the contrast is drawn between experimental sciences and observational and field sciences, with okay. historic field sciences being, you know, seen as the poorest of poor cousins because you don't control the experiment. Right. And there's some great literature on on why that contrast is problematic. Peter Casso, as a philosopher of physics, who's also written on archaeology, really does a nice job in a in a book of his on philosophy and archaeology uh, of of making the argument that really most experimental data are also of the past, right? The reports <laughs> on events and, I mean, and oh yeah, just, yeah. He develops it in much more simplest or uh, sophisticated terms than that suggests. But I would say um, there's not. I don't, well, and then there's a whole crew of really interesting philosophers of historical sciences. I'm thinking of Adrian Curry, for example, his, ex, his a blog that he co-moderates called Extinct. Mm. Uh, he's more interested in deep time geology and paleontology, but he does also work on archaeology. And there are a number of contributors to that blog. They're looking at the historical sciences, some of them. Mm -hmm. more physical ecology, evolutionary, biology kinds of sciences, but sometimes archaeology as well. And the arguments, um, I really like the arguments that, that Adrian makes because he's, he's crystallizing. I mean, I haven't done a lot of work on saying why archaeology shouldn't be seen as a poor cousin, but he's making exactly that kind of argument. And what he describes um, historical scientists as doing, uh, he describes them as being uh, methodologically omnivorous. So rather than having a very mm. narrowly defined set of research protocols, typical of the experimental sciences where you close down systems, you manipulate elements of them, things like that, um, the observational scientist has to use whatever tools or the historical science, whatever tools possible. Mm -hmm. And his argument on the one hand is against those who are radically optimistic, like Carol Cleland, that you have a kind of light cone model of an event in the past that 
you know, proliferation of effects from it, right? Uh, and then the pessimists who say, yeah, but there's so much attrition of those effects and, and our knowledge base for capturing and interpreting them is so limited. That would be Derek Turner. Um, uh, Adrian positions himself between that the epistemic optimist and the, ep the principled epistemic optimist and epistemic pessimist and argues that we should just take a look at what historical scientists are doing because it's immensely creative and yeah. innovative. And they're using all kinds of tools to deal with to exploit the possibilities, but deal with the limitations of trace evidence. Um, a big part of his account has to do with modeling as a source, another source of evidence rather than models of evidence or models of the past based on trace evidence. I'm one of the benighted trace, um, trace evidence theorists. I tend to okay. think in terms of how we work with traces. He has a more ambitious model. But anyway, so how does it relate? I actually think a lot of what uh, you see historical scientists of various kinds doing with trace evidence of various sorts and with modeling, whether you believe it generates new lines of evidence or not, yeah. um, is actually not that different than what goes on in other sciences and definitely should not be seen as epistemically, mm. in principle, more problematic. Um, and that's a lesson we should have had years, decades ago. Sure. You know, philosophy of science took the turn to do HPS and attend to practice. That, that you can't assume one model of science practice and, and assess everything with reference to it. That there are many, you know, a greater pluralism of, of methodologies. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Very good. Very good. <laughs> no, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, all right. So, so, so yeah, uh, you know, you went through some of the things with your, with your uh, undergraduate and graduate careers. Um, and so, you know, in terms of, you know, working on the PhD, finishing the PhD, um, you know, what was, what was the next step in your career? Uh, was it continuing on in philosophy of archaeology, um, doing some postdocs? Uh, I see it was, uh, in Australian National University. Was that, was that the next kind of oh, step? Oh, yeah, no, that was a recent, that's just a recent visit, a couple oh, of okay, visits. okay, I'm sorry about that. Few years. But, um, but yeah, when I finished, uh, when I started grad school, I should say, everybody was, everybody starting a grad program, the APA sent us all letters saying, go to grad school in philosophy only if you love it. There are no jobs. Right. <laughs> so that was like the trough of the job market, big hiring with expansion post, you know, in the sixties. And then by the time I was going to grad school in the late seventies, jobs were drying up and, or had dried up. Sure. And sure. so I, you know, I did it because I loved it and thought it was interesting. And by the time I finished, um, we were still in that trough. I mean, every every you know every cohort, it's the worst, right? <laughs> the worst <laughs> ever. But even um, then, even in the, even the early '80s, you're saying they were, they were still they were at least pretty forthcoming about it. Like that's not looking good. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But that yeah, that was interesting that they they made that move. I should dig into files and see if I kept that letter because I certainly remember it. I think I remember it accurately. But but yeah, what yeah. I did, there were no jobs. I really wanted to, I did apply for positions everywhere, but nobody was advertising philosophy of the historical sciences. Very few were advertising philosophy of social science. I was kind of an oddball. I'd get interviews because obviously someone on the committee was in, you know, had wanted yeah. to be an archaeologist when they were 12 years old. <laughs> <I didn't laughs> like we have a real archaeologist here. Come on. Let's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, you know, so they were interested, but you know, they're going to invest in, you know, their, the rare position that they're, you know, that they're going to get they they want they probably i think for the most part we're looking for more mainstream recognizable philosophers of science or in sub areas that were more mainstream i so sure. i went the route of uh writing um uh postdoc proposals and i first of all got uh one at the university of calgary and their institute for the humanities and and was there for a year and in that year i applied for a university of calgary university postdoc okay and that was a two-year gig um so i did that for a year then i deferred the second year because i got a mellon uh, uh postdoc at washington university so i did four years of postdocs and for me, where being philosophy and archaeology was kind of a liability because it's such an oddball little right. subspecialty, um, for these interdisciplinary, my impression is, of course, I never got feedback on this from the panels, but my impression is that having a foot, being really interdisciplinary and, and having a foot in these two different fields was actually a strength of the proposals I was writing for, for these postdoc panels. Um, so that's what I did for four years. And in that period, there was not a single 
tenure track position advertised in Canada. Oh. Um, and there, you know, and uh, I did get fly in interviews at various places and had nice conversations with people, but it didn't go anywhere. And then the fifth year, uh, the fourth year as a postdoc, um, you know, would be my fifth year uh, out. Um, I got interviewed at a couple of the, for the first time, there were a few positions advertised in Canada. And I got one in philosophy of science at Western, which was absolutely the most exciting place I could have gone because of its tremendous strengths in philosophy of science. Yeah. So that's how, you know, and then that was a regular job. And I have to say, if it's possible to get postdocs, I think it's a wonderful way to go because yeah. I got to be in these departments at WashU and at Calgary uh, as not, no longer as a grad student, as a colleague. Uh, so I was sort of on the other side of the table in the sense in terms of you got invited to department meetings and got to understand a bit how departments were run from the point of view of faculty, but I wasn't a permanent member. Yeah. Um, so nobody had had a fight about whether to have me or not, you know, for in perpetuity. Right? And sure. I didn't have a lot of service work and I, you know, and I got to really focus. I was teaching always one course, uh, a term or a semester, which was a great way to build teaching uh, experience. And I got to focus on my research. And, and in Calgary, there was Marsha Hannon in philosophy, originally a, a philosopher of science and of law who worked on evidence. And uh, Jane Kelly, an archaeologist, very prominent archaeologist, um, uh, Mesoamerican Southwest archaeologist, uh, they were writing a book together on methodology and the archaeology of uh, and, and the philosophy of archaeology. Methodology of archaeology and the philosophy methodology of science, something like that. And wow. so, so, and there's a, there was a freestanding and autonomous archaeology department there. So for me, it wasn't just kind of bridging to when I could get a real job. It was absolutely instrumental in shaping, broadening my horizons about philosophy of science and archaeology, and a kind of professionalization process that I really appreciated. Well, it sounds like the play you really. Uh, well, it was, sounds like a really fortunate experience such that there was a community directly related to your, you know, specialty discipline or your, your particular discipline, yeah. which is um, not always the case with postdocs, no, I can imagine. Cool. Yeah. yeah. In a university that had these postdoc opportunities. Yeah, um, yeah. You know. Well, so, no, this is really great. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm glad to hear it's, uh, I've spoken with a lot of folks and Different people have different experiences, and um, it's good to hear the uh, of yourself who you know seeing these postdocs not as you're right, just kind of stepping stones or ways to you know kind of wait around, but really as um, yeah, as you said, instrumental in uh, propelling your career forward. Really, yeah. I mean, I had some pretty bad experiences in the interview process too. And oh, really? The job market, um, oh, and I pretty like? much set a kind of five-year horizon that I, there was work I wanted to get out from my dissertation and beyond it. And I figured if there wasn't a real job by then, I would like go to law school. Sure. And sure. some of the kind of nasty game playing and real at back in the day, people were not at all discreet about what their prejudices were. Uh, you know, yeah. and so I, you know, get interview interviews or um, you know be uh, considered for a job, and there'd be like a member of the committee that was quite clear, no women need apply. Right? Or, oh my God. or if you're not doing philosophy of physics, you're not a philosopher of science. I mean, uh, like, yeah. Uh, real, that, those are the cleaned up versions of some of the crap I saw. And I thought, you know, I can do worse okay. than, uh, you know, going to uh, law school and kicking ass on equity. Yeah. There were enough really good experiences and people who were wonderful mentors and, yeah. Uh, cohorts of uh, people I met, you know, when we were all on the job market looking at these big bulletin boards posting who had interviews with, you know, we, some people had their sharp elbows out and were really nasty and competitive, but a lot of people, we were all in the same boat. And I got to know folks in that process who are dear friends and long-term colleagues. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't all dire, but there were some pretty astonishingly candid, um, you know, some, some people, were astonishingly candid in expressing their their prejudices and and not uh, at all shy about doing really explicit discrimination. So so I feel fortunate that despite that, um, yeah, you know, I yeah. did find a place in the profession. And as I say, you know, that overall, quite apart from that, the um, the the job market was so tight at the time that I didn't really expect. I would be able to make a career in philosophy, and I did have like a alternate plans in view. 
So yeah. anyway, that's Good. yeah. And so, and how important was it uh, for you to sort of? You mentioned like really looking around Canada um, for a for a position. I mean, was that really kind of the ultimate goal? Was to find a position kind of in the home in home, hometown or not necessarily hometown or, yeah. or was this just yeah. where you were looking origi- at first? And it's, well, yeah, not having a hometown. <laughs> right, that right. It, that, it wasn't a primary uh, thing, uh, 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 um, ambition. Uh, and uh, after I was at Western for 13 years and then moved to the oh, States, wow. I'm actually at Washington University. Then I was at Barnard Columbia for a couple of years and then uh, 12 years at, at University of Washington. So I've lived in the States now for 20 years. I've just moved back. And I was five or six years doing my graduate work. So I wasn't, it wasn't that I'd narrowed my search only to Canadian schools, but I did, you know, I, I, you know, I did think that if there was a a good job, I'd like to be back in Canada. And I'd always expected to move back to Canada. I just didn't think I could do it until after I'd retired. So I'm, you know, especially glad to be at UBC. Right, right. Before I retired, <laughs> it was to do you know a big a chunk of uh, work here, yeah, um, in Canada. So I, I you know in looking on your page and, and, and having seen some of your work, um, you know you've published and have written in, in a, a number of great areas. I mean, one more general philosophy of science, uh, philosophy of archaeology, as we've begin to, begun to discuss, it looks like research ethics, feminist philosophy, uh, as well as equity issues. Um, mm-hmm. And so, in, I, I guess, in terms of maybe sort of your early career, which uh, what projects were you working on, or, or would you care to share something about, you know, sort of, yeah, how your how your research trajectory developed, and what kinds of things were you working on? Whoa. Um, well, let me see. On the research ethics, I should say, um, and and sort of values in science issues, and now the collaborative uh, practice work that I'm doing, yeah. that comes directly out of ongoing engagement with archaeology and with archaeologists. In the early 90s, I was um, visiting at Berkeley. I spent two years as a, a visiting fellow in the archaeology program there. And one of my colleagues there was on the executive board for the Society for American Archaeology. They invited me or and, you know, um, gave me a, a re- requested that I develop a brief for the board on ethics of uh, the use by professionals of looted and commercially traded uh, archaeological oh. material. And I, I tried to explain to them that I'm not an ethicist and, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, this is not like, this is like asking a, within anthropology, asking someone yep. who does linguistics to comment on archaeology. <laughs> I don't know, you've been hanging around archaeology for so long. We, you know, we need you to do this. So I went to ground and learned a lot about uh, what the, what, you know, about the issues around looted data and, and other ethics issues. And the report that I made to the board, um, I recommended that they not just have a ruling on looted data, but actually review all the ethics statements and principles they had on the books in their bylaws and editorial policies and various other places. And so I got involved working, uh, co-chairing with an archaeologist, Mark Leinert, um, uh, uh, initially an ad hoc committee on ethics. Mm-hmm. And it was absolutely fascinating. I learned so much doing that work. Um, it, Oh, hold on one second. Oh, no, no problem. Something is, I thought I had these guys all turned off. Oh, that's okay. It sounds like a phone alarm. <laughs> yeah, I will just turn it off. Yeah. Um, okay, sorry. Just, yeah, you can edit that little bit up. Yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. so, yeah so I, yeah, I learned a great do- deal uh, doing that work. But one of, and we ultimately, the um, Mark, Lina, and I convened a committee or convened a conference of a whole range of people, probably 25 people, including some First Nations representatives, people, one person who was doing commercial salvage and a professional archaeologist working with commercial commercial salvers, museum people, people working uh, in the so-called old world doing classical art historical archaeology as well as archaeologists working in the Americas. Um, and they collected the, the very organically at that meeting, uh, the collective uh, decided to draft a set of ethics principles based huh. on a concept of stewardship. Now, we thought what we do is report back, here are the issues you need ethics principles to cover. What emerged very quickly was this commitment to shift focus from defending the scientific goals of archaeology as taking priority over all else yeah. to recognizing yeah. archaeological responsibilities as stewards 
of huh. archaeological record uh, accountable in that capacity to descendant communities, descendant communities to broader publics of various kinds, to those who produce the material themselves, the recently or long dead, I just, as well as professional colleagues. Um, but the, yeah, so that was, it's been very contentious and there are real problems with norms of stewardship because First Nations people will say, why do you get to set yourself up as stewards? You're primary users of this so-called resource. You value it in one way, which is not how we value it. And like your foxes setting yourselves up to guard the chicken coop was the argument. So there's been ongoing debate about that, and it, but it's drawn me into uh, serious work on ethics issues and political issues in archaeology. And it's demonstrated to me, it's really what sort of um, motivated me to, or, or made it clear to me that I could not consider the epistemic issues separately from these social contextual issues because the, because they're so deeply intertwined in these debates. And, and so that's, it really made a difference to how I think about archaeology. That's, so that's, one, that's a really yeah. interesting point that you make. Could, could you maybe expand a, a little bit on that? Like in a sense that they're intertwined and that one, you cannot, you really can't, uh, you know, consider one without the other. Could you give me either an example of that or, or maybe one way in which by considering the, the, Sort of this, this, the issues with stewardship and as the principle that this has informed the epistemic issues. Well, it's not so much the principle of stewardship that informed it, but more yeah. the broader debates around, and particularly around repatriation issues and um, Native American sovereignty issues, um, heritage, cultural heritage. Uh, uh, who owns the past is the slogan, all right? Right. But, oh, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. So where I, the way the connections for me. Uh, come where you recognize that archaeologists, the questions archaeologists ask, and what they count as evidence, and what count, you know, what counts as a well-formed question and and a, and a credible answer to it, is very much situated in a particular context and historical tradition of research practice, uh, and and things as you know seemingly fundamental as just class. Um, uh, uh, typology schemes in terms of which ar archaeological material is is described uh, very often have roots in 19th century you know Victorian uh, evolutionary theory or they're inflected by the interests of archaeologists in the Americas at a time when they thought Native American cultures were dead or would soon be it was a salvage operation uh, it's you know it was a very colonial settler state perspective on this material and the questions asked reflect that and the categories and the methodologies that became just now what you do as a matter of convention in various ways are inflected by those uh, those origins and once you recognize that uh, so critical history and various kinds of um, like feminist and critical race theorists and decolonizing activists within archaeology draw attention to those histories. But you can also see how situated archaeological interests are, even when they're not, it's not, you know, it's not sort of on the face of them. This is why we're doing it this way. When First Nations uh, collaborative partners or critics say, why are you not asking these other questions? Um, so recent papers that I've written, uh, one is uh, in a collection on objectivity that Alan Richardson uh, and, and two co-editors uh, put together based on a conference at UBC some years ago. I looked at a case of, um, it's called Kwade Danjinchi, a long ago person found human remains that melted out of a glacier, a high elevation glacier in uh, northern interior BC near the Yukon. Um, and in that case, it's in Asia Hick Champaign territory. They worked, they had a land management um, agreement. So they were in the driver's seat working with museum and archaeology and provincial representatives of various kinds. They they approved all the, they called for bids on work to be done on this guy who was fast frozen. Mm. So all his tissue was there, frozen, right? And they, they vetted and determined what could be done. And in that case, they really wanted to know, they wanted work done, not just to satisfy archaeological curiosity or physical anthropology curiosity, but to answer the question, which lineage, which clan should be responsible for putting this person to rest, um, to memorialize him. And um, they, 
actually asked for a community DNA study, which in general, you would not go to a First Nations community today and say, I want to do DNA, right? Uh, but they but they also authorize various kinds of destructive testing. The picture from dietary profiles, uh, from the DNA studies, uh, from analysis of the his um, his kit. He had a spruce root rain hat from materials from the coast. He had a big beautiful uh, squirrel cape. All uh-huh. squirrels from the interior. Uh, the diet, you know, the dietary profile, like what was in his, you know, his, what he'd eaten in the previous three days, started on the coast, but ended up, you know, with mountain stream mineral profile for water drunk in the mountains. But he had it like a in the previous year, based on hair analysis, his uh, his uh, diet had been primary primarily interior. Mm-hmm. Uh, from um, isotope analysis, bone core and dental core, his overall lifetime diet was primarily. Uh, marine. So what this demonstrates, what the, the the DNA ultimately, uh, uh, they they identified. Uh, they nobody expected they'd be able to do this because he's he died just under 500 years ago. So long enough ago that the physical anthropologist said you're not likely to find any empty DNA markers that would give you that specific a, a, a lineage connection. Sure. They found 17. The claim is they found 17 individuals, all but one or two in a particular clan with a distinctive DNA marker. So they knew which clan should take care of this guy wow. for, for ritual purposes. But the other, but then the payoff for the archaeology and anthropology is that here's somebody who clearly lived on the coast, was in the interior for at least a year of his life, traveling back and forth, not regionally located. And the elders and knowledge keepers uh, of the tribal communities in the regions that we've known this always, our people are not just limited the way, you know, on a sort of European state model to this piece of land. We have connections to the coast, we go back and forth, we have all kinds of of interlinkages. So it's a quite profound set of insights from uh, from you know for for archaeology that that destabilizes some foundational assumptions and brings into focus what can be learned from oral tradition which had traditionally been set aside as untrustworthy and you know what, yeah so there's a lot more to say about that but the yeah, implication yeah. is that the poli- the political context requires collaboration the moral obligation of most of the archaeologists involved they're 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 committed to doing collaborative work and what they say those who do it is it's really hard to do it doesn't always work uh you can imagine all the ways it could fail but when it does work you learn a tremendous amount that archaeologists would not normally questions they wouldn't have asked evidence they wouldn't have considered foundational assumptions they weren't questioning all of which the interaction with mm-hmm. close working partnership with, in this case, descent communities, First Nation descent communities, really uh, shook up. Really, you know, so you realize how con- how archaeology is itself situated and conventional, partly yeah. by contrast with what these partners will ask and what looks to them like. Why aren't you considering this evidence? Why aren't you, you know? So that's yeah. one way where it's a situated yeah. knowledge thesis that really opens this up for me. Mm. I can see that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No. Thank you for that explanation. So mm-hmm. yeah, and you, so you mentioned. So it's really interesting how your work spans. I mean, you know, you so you started some of this work, and now it's even more of recent that it's connected. You said some of the work that you just most recently described is the past decade. Would you say? Yeah, and yeah. the collaborative stuff I mentioned at the beginning. Exactly. Comes right of what I've just described. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Great. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. We're up to the present. We are up to the present. Well, did we miss anything? I'm trying to think. So, I mean, well, the feminist, yeah, feminist and equity work. I mean, yeah. the equity work I got drawn into, um, you know, I'd been interested in the second wave women's movement as an undergraduate. I hadn't done much on it. I mean, I wasn't very active on women's issues as they were then described as a grad student. But then as a postdoc, and especially when I went to Western, there was very active women's caucus at Western that I got involved in. And we did work on chilly climate issues. Uh, We did a report that was famous or infamous, depending on your view, that came out in 89 on workplace environment issues at Western. We'd interviewed, four of us interviewed, uh, I think it was 36 or something women faculty. And whether they were in supportive departments or dire departments, they were describing very similar patterns um, in the bad departments, overt hostility and marginalization. In the good departments, these patterns of small scale 
differences in uptake and response and support and you know differences in what kind of work people were assigned gender norm normative kinds of uh, service assignments and teaching assignments, differences in how their credentials were being pro projected, uh, you know, all the stuff of like the micro in that micro inequities uh, yeah. or implicit bias, right? Um, and so at the time, 82, 84, 86, there was a series of pamphlet reports that came out of the American Association of Colleges on the chilly climate for women, staff, students, faculty. That uh, was in, in inspired and formed what we did at Western. And we ultimately published a collection of essays called Breaking Anonymity uh -huh. that pulled together reports of various kinds on uh, chilly climate issues uh, from Canadian universities. So that was activist work that I got involved in and have continued to be interested in. And you can see how that connects up with the science and values stuff. Like why are questions being asked that come out of, you know, a colonial settler tradition of studying people who are presumed to be gone. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. And why are the living first nations communities that archeologists sort of often interact, you know, have interacted with to varying degrees. Why, why was that consistently, you know, deflected, not taken seriously margin? I mean, it, it, that's on a much bigger and uh, I don't want to do like a hierarchy of oppression, but a really consequential scale. Yeah. You see, overt discrimination, you see implicit bias, you see just kind of we're archaeologists and this is what we do, not intentional yeah. discrimination. Um, all of those patterns shape what counts as archaeology, what counts as good practice. And I see I, I'm interested as a feminist philosopher of science in um, feminist standpoint theory and analyses of what difference it makes when you get um, people of different backgrounds drawn into a field asking questions that weren't asked before. So think feminist and critical race interventions in various yep. fields. Uh, why it is, you know, contra about the expectations of value-free ideals, often those interventions really raise the bar in terms of the range of questions asked, the kind of evidence considered, the rigor with which background assumptions are scrutinized. Um, so as a feminist philosopher of science, I, the, the broader picture, uh, I'm interested in developing feminist standpoint theory in terms that are not tied to an essentialist conception of social identity and don't assume automatic privilege, uh, but rather uh, take into account how the situ situated knowledge is structurally configured, not just individual trajectory, but structurally configured by race and class and gender and age and other lines of differentiation in ways that make a difference to what you as an epistemic agent, as a knower, mm -hmm. are likely to notice, what evidence you have access to, what your heuristics are for interpreting it, what range of background assumptions you work with, what interests you. Um, so that's, that's a, a kind of convergence of that um, rooted in activist engagement um, of a feminist kind of trajectory of thinking about philosophical issues, uh, philosophy of science issues, how that, that converges on, connects with the, uh, oddly, with this work I've done forever on evidence. Yeah, and yeah. Stream, you know, how is archaeology a science? So yeah. I, I, see, I see that you, you mentioned in your, on your website that you're anticipating to complete a book on this topic uh, titled Standpoint Matters. Uh, is that right? Yeah. I've uh, published a number of papers and, and, and I have lectures I've read around over maybe 10 or 15 years. Um, so I have quite a lot of material, some of which is out there. And um, I have I, what I'm um, thinking through now, because as I do work on collaborative practice and do work with Bob Chapman on evidential reasoning, archaeology as a trading zone, situated knowledge in that context, critical reflexive practice in archaeology, it kind of shifts how I think about the standpoint project. So okay. it, it has, you know, I, I had material I'm sure I could have put together for a book a while back, but it, it keeps evolving. Uh, and yeah. so I need to put it together. Um, probably what I'll do, there are a couple, I have a number of case study based uh, papers and lectures on feminist uh, um, arguments about feminist methodology dating to the 90s uh, and 2000s, which uh, there's interesting updating to do on that. Feminist work in primatology, uh, feminist gender uh, research in archaeology, the work on chilly climate, grassroots equity research, um, 
uh, you know, again, feminist, uh, it mobilizes the resources of feminist standpoints uh, to do that work. And so what I want to do is put together a book that uh, incorporates those case studies and develops, uh, develops the analysis of how we could think about standpoint theory in sensible, non-essentialist, non, you know, uh, girls know best terms. Um, sure, sure. Not, not, you know, that, that your position uh, in a particular social identity doesn't, or hierarchy of identities, doesn't automatically make everything you know or believe more credible. That's the kind of essentialism, um, kind of identity, pol- epistemic identity politics that I don't think a standpoint theorist has to take on okay. or embrace. So that's the over that the pick I have in the APA presidential address I did in 2012, the Pacific Division. That's an overview of how I understand standpoint theory to have taken shape, what its central mission is, and how we should reconceptualize it. That would be juxtaposed with these case studies, with a final chapter that pulls in these broader lessons I'm learning from collaborative practice, where standpoints are mobilized not, you know, in, in more complex uh, ways, uh, very similar to feminist arguments, but not specifically feminist. Okay. okay. It's the project. <laughs> so this is an ongoing project. Um, and yeah, as you mentioned, we're, we're, we're caught up to the present um, uh, in terms of your number of projects you've had. And so now um, your, your particular positions at, at, of a university, so you were in... Um, you know, you, you spent a, a much of your time at uh, at Washington University, is that correct? Or University of Washington. University of Washington is where I just recently come from, yeah. Okay, yeah. and how was your time there? How was, how, what was your experience like? It was, in, it was in, great, yeah. yeah. I re- I, it's, a, it's a terrific university and um, a really lovely department. It's, uh, what, I, what I really liked about the department, really valued about it, the department in the last, um, I don't know, most of the time I was there, but especially the last few years, is that yeah. everybody in that department, whether they're doing history of philosophy or ethics or philosophy of science or m and they're all, they all, everybody has uh, an interest in philosophy engaged. They mm. have an interest in philosophy as it might be relevant to issues in the larger world and in drawing on engagement with practice in the larger world as in informing philosophy. So it's a very unique, uh, well, I don't, shouldn't say it's very unique, but a very strong positive feature of that department is that commitment shared by everyone. And it, to varying degrees, it, 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 it um, affects what kind of work they do. But, right. but it was, I don't know another department that has that clearly a shared pragmatist uh, commitment to engagement, but but you know, backed by a commitment to doing really rigorous um, philosophy in in somewhat traditional terms. So That's so that was great, yeah. Um, and there's you know, and I have quite a few colleagues here who have similar commitments. It's a it's yeah. quite a lot bigger department. Um, there's a very strong um, uh, philosophy of mind, cog sci neuroscience contingent here. Uh, so there's lots of interdisciplinary engagement uh, in, in that part of the world. So, yeah, that's what I look for. You know, that's, that's what I think is for me really important that a yeah. department has a strong uh, contingent of not, it doesn't have to be everybody as it happens. It's pretty much everybody at, at UW. Yeah. Uh, but that, that be respected and supported. I was at Durham. I was teaching one third of, you know, one term in Durham in uh-huh. the UK. And that was the big draw there, that Nancy Cartwright, when she was hired 50% at Durham, she set up this uh, Center for Philosophy Engaged with Science and Society. And that, that is uh, the one, maybe there are others, but it's the one I know of, a, of sort of an institutionalized, like a footprint in a university of a center yeah. with really strong colleagues whose central commitment is uh, to do philosophy grounded in um, yeah. research practice of various kinds uh, and that is responsive to the, you know, sort of broader social interests and concerns. Well, yeah. I hear, well, I hear that in, in the context of philosophy of science, as you had mentioned, we hear about things like the Society for Philosophy of Science in practice, and we talk about practice-oriented approaches, but it's, it's great to hear that there are additional, there's sort of this additional pragmatist, uh, shared pragmatist viewpoint of uh, philosophy engaged, which, uh, yeah. you know, again, getting people in traditional m and and, I mean, Things like ethics and political philosophy are often naturally engaged, or like more likely to be. But they, they cool can be. They <laughs> can be. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but to hear even things 
yeah, like as you mentioned, kind of everyone is on board, or almost everyone yeah. is. Uh, yeah. It's really cool to hear. In in their very various ways, yeah. So yeah, it's, yeah. Looking at the the chess, it is center for uh, humanities, engaging science and society. The the um, uh, Julian Reese and, and Nancy Cartwright and Wendy Parker, I believe, are the three co-directors of that at Durham University. And you just see a whole stream of, you know, events and uh, Twitter feed and so on about uh, what they all are doing in connection with climate science, um, oh, in yeah. connection with uh, in philosophy of economics uh, uh, for Julian and, and economics of medicine. Nancy with her big K4U knowledge for uh, for use project, uh, big EU funded initiative. That's a showcase for the kind of work that I find valuable. And mm. uh, Durham also had a center for ethics of cultural heritage and it's smaller and less active, but that, you know, for me, those, those two really track exactly my central interests. So I, I was, I'm going to stay connected with them, but it wasn't really feasible sure. to uh, be a CRC nominee at UBC and maintain that commitment. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So in going to UBC, did you, were you just uh, up for the change? It was it kind of getting back to Canada as of interest or? Uh, well, this, these see, you know, the, um, these CRCs are, um, pretty spectacular. And, yeah. Yeah. That's you know, phenomenal. Uh, yeah. So universities hold a certain number of them uh-huh, and, and, uh-huh. They, and they nominate people for them. It's the Canadian social science humanities research council that awards them at least in my areas, uh, you know, humanities, social sciences. Um, So when that opportunity came up, it just seemed too good to be true. I mean, it was really once in a lifetime kind of, and a very nice way to, you know, spend, I don't know what the last decade of, of my career to of be course, of course. Yeah. doing that. It provides research support, um, it pro- you know. So, uh, I mean, UW made a very nice counteroffer, but CRCs are pretty hard to beat. Okay. <laughs> yeah, of course. All yeah. right. So then now that you're, uh, you know, now that you're, you know, at UBC and under with a CRC, what's, um, yeah, what do, you, what do you foresee is uh, kind of like the future or currently, where, what are you working on now and what do you see is kind of going on for the, for the future? Well, pretty much the, uh, the project I described right at the beginning, that's yeah. what I, that's the main kind of thing I want to be working on. They, I have other evidential reasoning projects that I, 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 I want to build out of um, the book that Bob and I did. I'd like to dig into uh, analysis of robustness reasoning, triangulation, strategies of triangulation. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have this little checklist of five norms for virtuous uh, robustness reasoning versus the kind of robustness triangulation where it can be circular and that, that um, I, there's more work I'd like to do on that. I want to do the standpoint theory book. Mm-hmm. Um, so though that's pretty much covers it. Yeah. Cool. Great. Great. And there's you yeah. know, lots of support here for that. There's an STS science technology studies program here. Wonderful colleagues in that a very strong archeology span contingent and a great philosophy department. Fantastic. <laughs> Sounds like a great place to be. Uh, yeah. All right. It's, well, well, why don't uh, we, uh, you know, we can chat about some other things, but why don't I ask the question I've been asking many of our guests, which is, um, what do you see uh, to be the most challenging problem facing philosophy of science today? Well, interesting you should ask, since I'm, I'm, I'm just back from a, a governing board meeting for the for Philosophy of Science Association. Fantastic Sandy timing. Was, yeah, Sandy's the uh, president, Sandy Mitchell is the president, um, and Ken Waters is past president, and before Ken was Helen Longino, and at least those three presidents have really... Uh, transformed the association. There's just it's uh, it's night and day. I was on the board, maybe 15 or even 20 years ago, a long time ago, mm-hmm. and it was a pretty sleepy little board. And lots of recommendations were made uh, about things we could be doing, and it didn't really seem to get a lot of traction. Yeah. You know, so to get back on the you know to be elected, I'm I'm currently vice president. My term will start next January as president. Um, it's just like night and day. It's amazing how energetic and how oh, exciting. That's great. But, you know. So the board is now meeting every year rather than just at the biennial meetings. There's yeah. a lot of email traffic. There's a lot of there are a lot of initiatives spinning up. Um, and part of this was it, it was necessary. It was time. Um, you know, it was basically a society kind of wrapped around a journal. 
that's not right. going to be sustainable. Um, you know, that, because journals, any, you know, most people in the PSA can get the journal from their library. They're not joining the society just to get the journal. Yeah. But, you know, so, so it's partly of necessity. But also there's a vision of what the PSA could be. More engagement uh, with uh, with scientists, with practicing scientists in the various areas we work, more uh, public facing engagement. Philosophers of science should be the ones who get called and be weighing in on issues about fake facts and alternate facts mm -hmm. and what counts as junk science. And so, I mean, we we've, we've got a lot to contribute to issues that are really high profile uh, today. Um, and, you know, some journalists, you know, might have philosophy background and they know a few philosophers and they do get in touch. But I think uh, an initiatives that started happening under Helen, developed by Ken and, and very much by, by Sandy, are to really kind of build our public outreach in various ways. The meetings have been transformed. I hadn't gone to meetings for a number of rounds because yeah. I was going to SPSP, the Philosophy Social Roundtable. Yeah, sure. uh, lots of smaller groups in or SPSP isn't that small anymore, but more in my sub areas. And many of them actually spun off of the PSA because back in the day, 20 years ago, Philosophy of Social Science Roundtable, we were just finding we couldn't get Philosophy of Social Science papers or symposia on the program. So we uh. created our own. And I hear the same thing from others uh, who, you know, now there's philosophy of medicine, there's philosophy of economics, there's HOPOS, there's integrated history philosophy. So I don't know if the okay. history is the same for all of them, but Lots of horses are out of the barn. They're not going to be gathered back in the barn. But right. Helen initiated a really terrific, um, uh, what's now a sort of standing component of the program, which are the Cognate Society programs. So SPSP and, and HOPOS and, you know, um, area-specific Philosophy of Social Science Roundtable, they're invited to sponsor a session, to bring a session to the PSA so you can go to... Uh, a morning before the main PSA program starts and kind of find out what's going on in these societies. Uh, oh, that's it, great. It brings people into the PSA. I mean, some of them would come anyway, but some maybe not. Yeah. There's also a public forum that Sandy initiated last year. It was on race and medicine. And I see you have, um, I think, Kayshawn, Mm -hmm. uh, Spencer was your last interviewee. He organized this one on race, and he was the convener and moderator of this oh, session, well, yeah. the public forum, for the PSA in Atlanta. I'm organizing one, which is on algorithms. Oh, uh, okay. It will be in the public library. It's like a seven to ten minute walk from the hotel, it, and, it, and uh, there's a big, uh, beautiful auditorium there. We're hoping to pull in lots of Seattleites from Amazon and 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 uh, Gates, I mean, I should say Microsoft and, right. and you know, yeah. the, all the kind of IT uh, intensive uh, industries that are in the Seattle area, um, in which we'll have a panel of uh, philosophers and the director of uh, research labs at Microsoft. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, giving you know, g talking about algorithms in uh, uh, big data analysis uh, and in AI. So that's a public-facing uh, initiative that the, the PSA has developed. Um, those are all things that I, you know, the, the, so the short answer, I keep giving you long answers and then explaining what, how it's an answer to your question. Uh, well, I'm very excited to hear about this, <laughs> this meeting. It's already gotten me excited for the meeting in November. So, I'm, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I should, yeah, I, I should say that the, the um, philosophy panelists on the public forum are Sabina Leonelli, oh. who has this big project on uh, data intensive science, and Heather Douglas, who of course has done a ton of work on values in science and, and uh, yeah, um, value free ideal and, you know, lots of sort of technically engaged um, values in science work. So I think that it's going to be really exciting. But the major challenge that philosophy of science uh, I, the association, but I'd say the larger field faces, um, is is really uh, kind of moving our work from being very inwardly faced to being uh, much more broadly engaged. And, and that turn had been made decades ago with a more history philosophy of science and 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 practice or and a decade ago with more practice oriented work. But we need to capitalize on that. And the PSA, as one of the premier associations, I think is in a really good position to bring more of us together. Uh, you know, it can be a context where 
we're not just talking to people in our little pod of others who do just what we do, but we're right. hearing a lot about what's happening in all these cognate societies uh, where there's opportunities to do more public engagement kind of work. So that's what I um, that's what I think is a major challenge. And as I say, these previous presidents, I'm so lucky to be, you know, starting in in January as president because so yeah. much ground has been laid but that's what i see as the as my mission as a as an incoming president oh so you will be taking so sandra mitchell has been the president for is this like a revolving two-year position it's always two years yeah, yeah. and her term ends this next december mine right. starts in january um uh, so vice president is the incoming one and then yeah. the past president so so it's a very active and wonderful board um oh, lots of ideas so i think that's yeah that's that's all positive um and I, you know, this ought to be a context in terms of what's happening in the world and also in universities, where philosophers of science, we have so much to contribute, and we just need to make sure that that's recognized, uh, get the word out, develop synergies among ourselves to be more effective in doing that, do do our best work, um, but make sure that it's getting traction in places where it's needed. Great. And so, in terms of the in the meeting uh, that you guys just had. Um, will, will there be some sort of a, a meeting report, anything that's published, or uh, is there anything to report in terms of uh, yeah. what we can expect? I mean, obviously, it's yeah. you know a private meeting, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, one of the big things as a, an association that uh, yeah. the previous presidents uh, have been doing that I want to do more of is really take stock of our communication with members. Now, yeah. Sandy did a president's letter to when she came, shortly after she came in as president a year ago. Um, she uh, will be doing another such letter shortly. And so that's one way. They'll be reporting on all the committees that we've got, an enormously ambitious committee structure at the moment. Oh. And, that, some of which is online, but she was outlining it and inviting people to volunteer themselves in that letter that she did, her, her president's yeah. letter. And so that's one place where you'll get news of what, what we're doing. But also, I mean, there, there are kind of nitty gritty governance kinds of things. Uh, for example, our, the conference organizing had always been handled by the History of Science Society. And uh, what we've done is, and so that meant that a lot of our business, uh, as you know, the sort of uh, executive director um, Jessica Pfeiffer does mm -hmm. with assistance in the PSA office, society office, had been done by the HSS. Well, over the last couple of years, uh, we've negotiated, um, we, we ended up deciding, I mean, it was back and forth, I wasn't involved in a lot of it, but we're not, we're going to be doing our own business. Uh, we're running our own meetings. So this meeting in Seattle is going to be the last one where we're joint with HSS by oh. virtue of them running the meeting. We, we've invited okay. them to co-locate with us in our next meeting, which will be, uh, I believe, in Baltimore. Okay. And then the meeting after that will be in Pittsburgh. But um, we've invited them to co-locate. They may want to co-locate with other societies. We may want to co you know, invite others to, to join us. But we're running our own show. We've got big enough and we've got enough initiatives of our own that that, that now makes sense. There's been discussion of this for decades okay. and that makes sense. Um, so there are a lot of, there's a lot of behind the scenes, getting our systems up and running, um, getting all these ambitious committees up and running. Social media committee has brilliant ideas about what we great, need to do. Great. It's just how do we roll it out? So there's a lot, you'll, you'll start to see things or you, and you probably at the meetings, you already see things Yeah. like yeah. poster session we had at the last meeting. Right. That right. Was a brand new initiative. And we think it's just a wonderful, I think that's going to bring so many more folks. Well, it probably already did. I'm not sure how the yeah. attendance changed from 2014 to 2016, but uh, I'm sure it brought, you know, it's going to even bring in more. I know folks, uh, you know, we're all preparing to pre either if we haven't submitted papers, we're, we're submitting posters. So Definitely do posters and posters will you can put things on posters that could be submitted for symposia or papers. But posters also broaden the catchment of what's yep. represented at the meeting. There were a lot of senior people who um, brought posters about current projects they're engaged in. Mm -hmm. Uh, collaborating oh, with scientists, right? So Andrea Woody with her chemistry collaborators at Princeton had a wonderful, brought in her very high-profile senior chemistry right, right. 
there they were at their poster with all the philosophy <laughs> of chemistry people kind of making a beeline from what I could see. Um, but then also um, posters on educational initiatives, teaching philosophy of science initiatives and okay. posters on um, there was a poster on equity issues in philosophy of science. Uh, so there's a range of things that are good for posters that we, you know, probably couldn't, uh, wouldn't fit in a normal um, symposium or 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 S paper session. Sure. So it it serves a lot of purposes, and I loved the way it was scheduled, so that it was kind of like a social gathering as well. Yeah. Uh, Back in the day, it would be like smokers, or it would just be a reception. Well, this was like a reception <laughs> wrapped around. Then you know, there's some posters over there. Or something. Fabulous posters. So, yeah. so there's a lot happening. And as I say, it's the you know I'm not yet president, but it's like current Sandy and yeah, the yeah. two, especially Helen and Ken, who really turned the corner on thinking hard about what the PSA could be for its members as a community, building a community. Um, what it, yeah, what its well, members do for it and what it could do for its members. Well, I'm so, well <laughs> I'm so happy to hear. It's exciting. I, I mean, just from talking to you know folks like yourself, and then especially like some of the more emer emerging philosophers of science, they're look you know they're looking for a community. They're excited. Yeah. They want they want a P they want a PSA. They want a society that is more that or that is you know a place that can be that can have that community that can draw them in. And and certainly it's the case that a lot of them uh, sometimes it's just because those other conferences, uh, you know, tend to be a little bit more specific to their work, you know, yeah. those have become more of their home than the PSA. So I'm really yeah. looking forward to a place where, you know, every, everyone's going there, but then still the PSA is that which is, you know, this big community building, you know, society. That, that Yeah, you know, it's you know, linking it's, people together. I mean, I think, yeah, yeah, I mean, there was a time, you know, before I was inducted back onto the board when I thought, you know, maybe the PSA had its day and sure, it's a journal, sure. but it's, you know, but actually I think it, there really is a role for a society like the PSA to, to link together all those, uh, those initiatives, those splinter, those, those uh, area specific societies. Um, so that's, Great. that's what I see as the big, that's the, the challenge. Yeah. Okay. I need to go. Yes, yes, I don't want. Uh, yeah, I do not want to keep you. Anyway, I just wanted to formally uh, sign off and say thank you once again. And uh, um, yeah, well, again, it was a, it was wonderful chatting with you, and really fascinating to hear more details about your research. And I'm I'm really excited to see what happens, or like to learn more about it. And uh, I'm really excited for the PSA coming. Thank well, you. thank you, and this. Yeah wonderful Phil Sci podcast you're doing is really part of it's just the kind of thing that we need to do do what I hope can some of which can be done through the PSA so thanks for doing this of course yeah. of course yeah thank you again all right we'll have a wonderful afternoon and uh, enjoy your meeting and uh, I'll be in touch soon great take care okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs>